Well, it's a great privilege to, to be here. I've not been on this campus before, but I feel like I'm coming home a little bit. The, uh, where are my University of Chicago Press people? Here, so uh, there they are. <laughs> uh, so, the, so it was published by the folks here, and they're the ones who, who believed in it. Um, and often when I've gone around talking about the book, I, I cite the Chicago Zone Phil Ponce. I uh, worked with him years ago when I was a producer at the PBS NewsHour. And he, he was, when I first started to do some public radio, he would talk about how, how do you kind of talk in front of the microphone, in front of people, and he sat me down. He's one of the world's nicest people, as you may know. And he said, when you, you sidle up to the microphone and you just pretend you imagine you're talking to the person who's interested in everything you say, <laughs> and just pretend that person exists. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I've kind of taken that with me uh, everywhere as I've uh, you know, con gone into mostly radio studios. Usually we're talking to people or talking to a room that doesn't have any people in it, uh, these soundproof rooms. So it's great to be engaging and talking with actual people who are, who are interested in the topic. So really great to, to be here. So what I'll do is I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the origins of the book and how I got started on this project. Uh, it took a very long time. Um, I'll talk about, uh, you know, a few, a couple action stories about characters who I write about in the book, and then uh, some kind of broader takeaways about what I learned about the longer story of China and how it got here um, uh, through that. And then, I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit, if we have a little time, about some of the uh, reception and feedback I've received uh, since the book came out. There are, you know, certainly a few haters out there, and it's been interesting to engage, but certainly learn from the uh, feedback and conversation that I've had with uh, uh, d different people in, in the audience. Uh, a few trolls from Facebook came out who uh, you know, don't, don't seem to be human beings, and I've kind of engaged with them as well. So that's been interesting uh, experience here. So um, in this crowd, how many of you have not been to Shanghai before? <laughs> it's, it's better to ask the question that way because uh, most of you have. So the kind of the starting point as I thought about this book project goes back to when I first moved to China. Uh, my first reporting story in China was 2005, 2006. I moved with my family there. Um, and I was in a cafe on the other side of, you know, these, these bright fancy buildings here. I think soon after I got there, you know, the, the bottle opener building had just opened. And they, you know, of course, they bring in the reporters. And, and this framing of the narrative is that this is, you know, China is the story of today and tomorrow. And this banker who I had coffee with when I first got there, he said, you know what happens with you people when you first come is you get the skyscraper syndrome. Right, you see these shiny, fancy things. Uh, you're in the news business, so you're always looking about at what's new. And you look at China, and you think it's, it's a right now story. Uh, and so that's what we do. People like me, we go there, and we do stories like one of my first profiles that I did in China is I went to southwestern China to, uh, and found a migrant worker in the gigantic city of Chongqing. So I went with a, a Chinese fixer, uh, a translator. Her name was Rachel because she watched every episode of Friends and decided she, she wanted her name to be Rachel. And uh, we found this man, and you may have seen these kinds of porters in Chongqing who walk around with these giant bamboo uh, sticks across their back and you pay them and they carry something for you. You know, they're at the bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, and he lived in this very forlorn kind of home on the outskirts of the city with like 15 other guys in uh, you know, what to me were horrific living conditions. And then I asked him, I, I want you to take me back to your village so I can kind of understand more of where you came from. Uh, and it turns out that his home village is really in the same area as uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, original village, so Guang'an in Sichuan province. And we took a bus ride there, five hours or something on a bus. And then he goes back and he's big man on campus in this little tiny village. And that's kind of the story of the man who leaves the village, goes to the big city, and he makes good. And they had a lunch for him as he returned home, and this kind of strange, you know, foreign Chinese American visitor, reporter there. And his neighbor hosts this lunch, and his neighbor has this gigantic walk, right, the biggest walk I've ever seen. And so I'm with this, uh, the guy I'm doing the story on, Mr. Xu, 
And I said, you know, this is the biggest walk I've ever seen. It's maybe five feet across. And Mr. Shu points to it and says, mine's bigger. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a great story. It's a true story, right? It, it, it helps encapsulate what's happened in a single generation in China with the reform period and the opening. And we were in Deng Xiaoping's hood. And, and that's often how China is framed. That's, how, that's often how I understood China as being a pretty new story. And to the extent that there was much history that people talked about, it was this, you know, the general framing of history that certainly the, the Chinese government, uh, it's their version of the story to tell. But it's also on the ground level a version of the story they tell, too, of China's kind of fall, uh, foreign humiliation, a century of humiliation, followed by the redemption, right? And so that's generally a new story. So when I left in 2010, I realized I didn't have a good enough understanding of this longer version of the story and where China came from. So I started to think about this, uh, this project and read the history books I told myself I was going to read while I was there and uh, connected with uh, you know, kind of economic historians on the mainland and here to kind of understand the, uh, the broader story. So the book um, profiles five people across five generations in my family tree. And uh, so as I think about this, or, or more what I kind of extracted from some economic historians, is they connect what's happened today to the, an early period of opening in China that goes back a century, when uh, a lot of scholars, including my great-grandfather, kind of left China to interact with the modern ideas from the outside and planted some seeds of modern ideas um, uh, from a century ago. And then... Um, you know, the middle generation, there's this kind of, as far as this opening story, this kind of great interruption in the Maoist period. And my uncle's story, my father got out, his brother didn't get out, and his life kind of helps, to, helps me to understand that part of the story. And then, to some degree, this kind of resumption with the, with the reform and the opening period. And uh, the life of my cousin, who, who was, you know, his father got left behind. I spent a lot of time with him. He lives in Shanghai, works for General Motors. Uh, that was part of the story. And then uh, this is my daughter on the bottom right. And she, uh, she is, uh, we adopted her from China in the middle of this big adoption scandal and crisis, this kind of baby selling uh, stories that you may have heard about in China then, the, kind of those interactions with the global economy too. So in my family's story, and what my uncle tells me a lot is, you know, so many Chinese families have this story. Um, this is just ours. So why do you want to write it? <laughs> uh, is that, you know, my family has a lot of Chinese nationals that were connected to the outside world. So when China was open to the world earlier on, they were the opportunists, and they had great education and other opportunities. They uh, connected to missionaries from the US, among other places. When China closed its doors, they were the prisoners and the scapegoats at the time. And then when the doors opened up again, the people in my family often were the opportunists once again. So there are people who you know, landed on the right side of history and then many on the wrong side of history. And I chose these individuals to kind of frame the story around. So, uh, so this is my, my great-grandfather, uh, who was the first as best we know, out of the Tong family village, kind of middle of nowhere, northern Jiangsu province. And um, I, I'm going to just read really briefly the adventure of, uh, of my dad and I trying to find the, the Tong family village. So this is 2009. And my father, my folks live in Portland, Oregon. They came back to visit us and to see the grandchildren. We have three children there. And we said, no, let's go try to find the village. And we thought it was going to be easy. Um, so the place we're looking for was once called Fu Ma Ying. That's the old name of the village, but it went obsolete in 1949 when the communists took the mainland and proceeded to rewrite history and street names and town names. At the local registry in the nearest city, Huayan, no one had ever heard of the place or of any tongs in this area. At a nearby police station, officers said little and they offered less. So we resorted to pestering strangers. Pedestrians, cabbies, food peddlers, for some sign of this Fumaying place. And quickly, the inquiries took on a predictable sequence. An initial moment of hope, a diversion from the main topic, and finally, the phrase, it's not very clear. So at the bus stop by the canal, so the Tong village is along the Grand Canal in eastern China, longest canal in the world. 
At, at a bus stop next to the canal, I approach a middle-aged man with a crew cut and a face weathered by a life of farming. Before he can talk his way out of this, I pounce. This much I've learned as a reporter in China. When you spot your prey, you cannot hesitate. Hi, I say, we're looking for a place called Fu Ma Ying. Have you heard of it? Fu Ma Ying, the man repeats the words out loud. And then as if it would provide some further illumination, he says it again, but three times as loud. He said, why are you going there? Well, it's our, it's our old home. It's our lao jia, our old home. So I'll kind of skip ahead. We kind of talk around the world about a lot of things. And, and uh, the crew cut man says, Shanghai is it's too crowded and too chaotic. You know, they're snobs and they're looking down on us country folk. Yes, they are. For this, I have no argument. Are you traveling by yourself? And I say, no, my father's with me in the car. He also lives in America. So, Fu Ma Ying, can you help me find it? Another pause, but <laughs> Qingchu. It's not so clear. So I've lived in greater China off and on for more than a dozen years. I've taken years of Mandarin lessons. I can recite a Tang Dynasty poem. I drink bubble tea, but my understanding of China ends at the phrase but <laughs> Qingchu. In a literal sense, the phrase means it's not very clear, but it has this lingu linguistic flexibility. And every time I grasp a new context for but Qingchu, it turns up in a new way. It means at least these things. I can't help you. I won't help you. I don't want to tell you. I'll get myself in trouble. You don't deserve to know. And I'm moving on now. The great paradox of China is people make declaratory statements with absolute certainty sometimes. But at crucial moments, they reach into their pockets and they pull out bu tai qing chu. <laughs> so my dad and I are, are spending a day and it's about 4.30, and, and my assistant calls, and she's in Shanghai, and she says, well, I went on the internet, and I found a town that might be close to where your village is. So we drive to the town. We've been driving in circles all day trying to find this village. We actually don't know if it still exists. As you, many of you know, a lot of Chinese villages aren't around anymore. And uh, we get to the town, and we pull a guy aside. He's crossing the street after his work day, and we kind of drop the name of this place, and he goes, you know, it's, it sounds kind of familiar. But I know a guy, and, and uh, he's lived here longer than I have, so let's go, go find the guy. And so he gets into the van. So it's my dad and me and our driver, and then this guy walks in. Uh, and then we kind of drive kind of to the outskirts of the town. It's a little town. Um, and we, the second guy comes in, and he says, oh, yeah, no, I've heard of this place. I know it. But the person who definitely knows it is, well, I know a guy. <laughs> And so he gets in, and then we go pick up the third guy. And he walks in, and the car goes quiet. It's, just, it's like a priest had just walked into the car. And I'm the last person in the car to realize that this is the party secretary. So this is the senior, most senior Communist Party person in this little tiny jurisdiction, middle of nowhere, uh, eastern China. And he gets in, and he leads us to the village. And he looks like this is the Grand Canal. How many of you have been along the Grand Canal? I'm sure, no, not, not as many of you. So this is him. And he, right, he kind of has this members only jacket, circa 1982. <laughs> and, uh, and he has, his hand is in this posture all the time. Uh, but, uh, but he's connected, he knows where the places are. Uh, he takes us and he takes us to the village. Where, uh, and the village is, you know, it's kind of along a creek where a woman is washing vegetables. Doesn't look like a creek that's supposed to be washing vegetables. Um, and we're, boy, this is such a long time ago. Boy, my, that's my youngest up there who's now 13. And it looks like a lot of villages in, in China where you have these one floor or two floor homes and each, each house has a, you know, small plot of land where you can grow a few things, but not enough to grow at scale. So, uh, you know, the, the math, the economics are to send a young person out, as you all know, to go to a city and make money and, and send it back. And so long as you can keep it going, the village stays around. So the Tong village maybe has about 100 people left. Um, and so if you ignore the Americans on the left, <laughs> Uh, there, there are only two children in this, and, and the rest of the village is mostly uh, older people. Um, and so this is the women in the village, and these are the men in the village. And so my father goes around introducing himself, and in Chinese, you, you ask, what's your honorable last name? 
And so I think it's that guy with the, uh, the hat. Maybe he was the first person we met. And he says, oh, my name is Tong Guangde. So the same last name, right? And my, my uh, surname in Chinese is really unusual. It means child. And there aren't too many people with this last name. And we say, wow, that's, that's great. And we move on to the next person. And my dad does the same game, right? What's your honorable last name? And the next guy says Tong Daren. So he's got the same last name, too. So we start going around, and, and we actually don't have to go very far because they're all around us. And, and uh, we, we end up realizing, but we're kind of the last people to realize it, because now they're looking at my dad and me like we're idiots, because everybody has the same last name. <laughs> uh, we've never met so many Tongs in one place at the same time. And they explained to us this is one of those places where it doesn't tend to attract people from anywhere else, as, as, which is one reason why this, like a lot, of, uh, or a number of villages in China, people have the same surname. Uh, and what we, what we learned about my great-grandfather was, um, uh, this is, it turns out to be my third cousin, our, our closest relative in the village. I'll, I'll stay on him, is my great-grandfather. was born in 1880, and he was a scholar who who got out, he was the first mover in our branch of the family tree, and he went to Japan. So he got a public scholarship to go to Waseda University in Tokyo, and uh, he was with this, this important generation of Chinese intellectuals who were in Japan kind of interacting with the modern ideas at the time. Japan was the most modern place then, and it's this kind of brand name list of Chinese thinkers, Liang Qichao and Sun Yat-sen and Lu Xun, and, and so my great-grandfather is part of this group. What we learned and what I learned in subsequent trips to Japan is that uh, he, he joined some of the meetings of a semi-underground political group known as the Tongmeng Hui, which is the you know, precursor of the Kuomintang, which uh, of course toppled imperial China after several failures, failed attempts. Um, he studied law at, uh, in Tokyo, and we learned that he married a Japanese wife, which came as a great surprise to his Chinese wife back in the village. Uh, you know, kind of turn over these rocks, and you kind of learn these things, and then you ask your parents, well, what do I do with this information? Um, and, and he came back and eventually practiced law in China, came back to the village, and he, uh, he died in the early 60s. So my big takeaway from my great-grandfather's story is you know, some historians look at this earlier period a century ago or so as uh, some use the word enlightenment, that this is a part of uh, China's enlightenment generation, where they were connecting with the, the isms of today, you know, Darwinism, empiricism, feminism, uh, Marxism, right? The, these ideas came somewhat new to China. China came late to some of these ideas, and these early seeds uh, were kind of planted, you know, taken from the outside and planted on Chinese, Chinese soil. Um, a lot of the history, the economic history of China has been kind of described or seen through the camera angle of the Westerners and what they brought in uh, to China. Uh, another important camera angle has been kind of development from within China, right, and how, how this development uh, came from uh, within the mainland. I think an undertold version of the story is the is the Chinese nationals who are kind of straddling all this, right? These cultural hybrids, uh, who you know often didn't have you know they, they didn't have defenders. They were often you know prisoners or they're, they're controversial people, and the people in my family are these cultural hybrids, and so that is a way uh, of again kind of understanding the story, and that's my family's version uh, of the of the story. Second person I want to tell you about is. Uh, this is my maternal grandmother, uh, and she was born in 1903. So in 1911, the year of the, um, the, the Chinese Revolution, the, the end of imperial China, um, someone in her family, she was born in Nanjing, uh, the city of Nanjing along the Yangtze River, someone in her family decided that she was going to have her feet unbound. So she had bound feet like a lot of you know, girls in elite families, her feet were unbound. And they decided to send her to a missionary school run by American missionaries. In the middle of nowhere, China, the Jiangxi province, the city of Nanchang. So it's not even that close. So as best we know, you know, she went with her father and maybe her mother. And they kind of went up the Yangtze River, um, uh, took a left at the city of Zhejiang, ran across this big lake of Poyang, and they ended up in the city of Nanchang. And she went, 
to uh, what was called the Baldwin School for Girls. And so my, 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 her daughter, my mother, didn't know a lot of her story until we started kind of pursuing this. This is another picture of my grandmother there, uh, kind of a ration coupon document. Oh, this is when she was in uh, college in Nanjing. So after this boarding school, she went to Jingling, uh, the college for women then. And this is the Baldwin School back then. And what we learned is this is, to me, this fascinating collision of women's stories uh, of uh, young women from Chinese families who went there. And in, in that particular school, there were young American missionary women who, you know, early 20th century were unsatisfied with the options they had in the world. And they wanted to go, and their adventures took them to China. We do know that as far as converting souls, there's pretty mixed record. Um, uh, but we also know that um, in their, they did a lot of literacy work. And for uh, feminist historians who look at this period, there's a great book called Women in the Chinese Enlightenment uh, by a Michigan scholar who, as they think about it, some of the early breakthroughs in, uh, in the Chinese women's story go back to, to the Chinese women of this era. Now, in contemporary China, they, they've been, you know, because they didn't always end up with the party, they're not, they've been kind of nudged out of the frame of history uh, in some cases. Uh, but what we learned about my grandmother was in her class, they learned, uh, so they performed a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, and they read a Doll's House, you know, it's kind of this uh, um, defining feminist literature. And... Um, and they did things like this. I mean, the, this kind of Western uh, I ideas of um, physical education, that kind of thing. And she played piano for the Glee Club uh, circa 1915 or so in, in Nanjing then. Um, in her, and so my grandmother always wanted to come to the United States because of the, the teachers she connected with. She didn't make it, um, but she did. What we learned is she chronicled her life in these letters. Uh, to her American teacher. So this is why they should still teach cursive, right? Uh, and so she was 17 at the time, and she, this is the oldest letter that we found, which is at the archives in Boston University. So her teachers went on to become, you know, somewhat known uh, literacy advocates around the world, and their documents are all preserved. One, of, one group of documents is at Boston University, the other at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. And, and the, for my grandmother, she never made it to the United States. A lot of her colleagues came, you know, went to the UK and they came to the US. Um, in her case, she had a number of setbacks. She had medical problems and wasn't able to finish college. Uh, her, her father died, her male, main male patron died when she was young. So this was during, in the 1920s, during the Northern Expedition in Chinese history when you know, the troops were trying to unify China and uh, take on the warlords then. Uh, she, uh, there was a warlord who was, in, who was running the city that she and her family lived in at the time, which is Wuchang, one of the three cities in Wuhan, the Chicago of China, right? <laughs> um, as they say. And so Wuchang then was a walled city and there was a siege during the Northern Expedition. And so she was living with her family then, 40 day siege, cut off everything, and her father died on the 32nd day. Um, so her father dies when she's young and she has medical problems. And then in 1931, again in her home city, she goes back to, uh, to Wuhan, uh, this uh, three city metropolis. And as you, you may know, the worst flood in recorded history comes in 1931 and she gets washed away and, get, and, like a lot of people, gets relocated to a place where so many people relocate, and that's Shanghai. And so she, uh, she marries a husband who's from her uh, home city as well, and they, they build a school in Shanghai. But she never makes it to the United, the United States. They have a lot of financial problems. Uh, and this, is the, uh, this goes to the, kind of the issue of shame and embarrassment in family history in a, you know, in a culture like China, Confucian culture is her husband was a convicted collaborator during the Sino-Japanese occupation. So he was convicted of working for the Japanese occupation then. And uh, we actually learned a lot about that. I can talk about that later if anyone is interested, uh, that um, uh, he, he was in food distribution in his city, uh, but he was arrested and sent to a labor camp in northwestern China, in Qinghai. Uh, 
uh, and I kind of got to go out and chase that version of the story as well. But for my grandmother's story, you know, hers, um, a lot of her stories she never told to her children, right? By, by the time my mother was born, she was the youngest of three. You know, my grandmother had already been defeated, and, you know, she didn't have these aspirations anymore. And because it's a, a story of, you know, it's not a successful story, and I have a lot of these stories in my own family's history, and I'm sure a lot of you do too, you know, people tend not to talk about uh, that version of the story. So until I started working on the story, um, I really didn't know this chapter of it. So the takeaway for me is the, you know, the power of shame, kind of the great silencer. We reporters talk a lot about censorship, official censorship, uh, you know, self-censorship in a lot of contexts is much more powerful, I think, as far as people not wanting to tell their stories. Uh, so, um, oh, this is one of the documents we found in uh, where their school is. Uh, uh, where their, my grandmother's name and her, her husband's names are, are, he was born in 1905 on the far right there, and their names were crossed out when he was arrested, and, and it indicates, uh, it's at the bottom there, uh, where he was, he was sent to this notorious jail in Shanghai called uh, Tilan Chao Jail, the Ward Road Jail, and then he was sent to a, a labor camp in, uh, in Qinghai. Uh, the labor camps there, no names, you know, it just, it's these kind of mass grave sites. Uh, tried to find anything, any identifiable information for him, did not have any luck uh, on the advice of a, of a bureaucrat. I think the unsung heroes in the book are these bureaucrats who actually helped me find a lot of documents. I didn't tell him I was a reporter. <laughs> and I, you know, I went back and just played up this grandson of China story and I wanted to, to learn and it was remarkable how much help I got from people I, I didn't know and didn't expect to have help, help from. And on her advice, she said, you know, so many Chinese families have these people who disappeared into these labor camps, never came back. Obviously, China is not the only place, you know, Argentina, Chile, all these other places have these tens of thousands of people who disappeared, didn't come back. And in China's case, a lot of people are going here trying to find information. The files aren't there. And this bureaucrat told me, and she, she went through all the files to try to find anything on my grandfather. She said, the best thing you can do is what the advice I give others is you kind of scoop up some of the soil from the mass grave site, and you bring it back, and you have something to remember your, your relative by. Uh, so, so, we, so we did that. Um, the, okay, I'll, I'll tell you uh, briefly about uh, two other folks, and then I want to kind of get to your questions. So this is my, my uncle. Uh, so in 1949, you know, the year of the, the liberation, the, when the communists took power in China, my dad was 10 years old and he got out with his father. And his brother got left behind. And so this is my uncle. And he has this great redemption story uh, in, in Chinese history that helps me to understand the economic story of China. But he really didn't want me to tell it because, again, it's embarrassing. So when he was two years old, uh, his father leaves and the communists take over, and suddenly he's politically stained because he's connected to the wrong side, right? Because his father, my grandfather, was a law professor at a university that was connected to the losing side in the Civil War, the side the Americans supported, uh, and he was in Taiwan, so, uh, the, the anti-communist uh, side. So he has, and whenever I would ask him about his story, he would say over and over again, the problem he had, and he, the term is hai wai guan xi, Right, so he has overseas relations, and this is the crime, right? This is the, this is the, the, the status that, that, one of many statuses you don't want to have in this period in Chinese history. So he has Hai Wei Guan Xi, and what does that mean? He was a great student, but he was never allowed to go to the better schools because of that. Uh, during the Great Leap Forward, so kind of late 50s, 1960, during the famine at the time, so he's 13, 12, 13 years old or something, they, their food rations are, are less than others. You know, during this famine that killed some 40 million people in China, he would talk about you know, the, the fortuitous day that they found, he found a frog on the way back from school so they could eat and the family could prepare it. And a lot of people in China, their famine stories include eating tree bark, right? Uh, and he would talk about that, how they ate tree bark to survive. And I would ask him, you know, what, did you just rip the bark off the tree and just eat it? And he said, no, silly. We cooked it. Uh, and, and so he would tell me these stories uh, of his childhood. And then he, he finishes high school just in time for the Cultural Revolution. So 1966, children who have the wrong status, they get sent down to the countryside. 
And so my uncle, because of this overseas relations problem he has, he gets sent down to the countryside for a decade, for 10 years. Uh, he does meet his wife there, so that's the, the bright side of the story. Um, and then in the late 70s when Mao dies, right, they bring back, right, the universities had shut down, the schools had shut down, they bring back the schools, the universities, and they reinstate the college entrance examination. So by then my uncle's almost 30. And 10 years worth of kids are waiting to take this test, right? So he's with all of these kids, the oldest one there. And he aces it. And he loves to tell the story of how, you know, 4.4%, something like that, uh, of people passed the test and got into college. And I was one of them. It, I mean, as, as, as you know, a lot of people, when they kind of tell their history, they think about it in empirical terms, right? How many grams of food did we have in the famine? Uh, what percentage of kids passed the test? So he aces this test. And he becomes a professor, an engineering professor, and a consultant for the early you know, factory era in China when factories were, had contracts with the US companies to make. So he was working for a factory contracted to make power tools for Black & Decker. Right, Baltimore, Maryland, American company, and, and that's where actually most of his, his income came from. He made a little bit of money at school. So to me, it's this great story, and I spent hours in Shanghai with him trying to understand the story. And then he goes, but a lot of this you can't tell. You can only, I want you to only write the glorious parts. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know how to just extract the glorious parts. You know, the whole story goes together. Um, and he said, well, some of it is shameful. And, and then uh, his wife, my aunt, comes in, joins us at the table, and, and very helpfully says, well, why don't you just make it a novel? Um, I said, no, that's not what I'm working on. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm kind of bargaining, arguing with him. And, and I say, you know, first of all, uh, I mean, he, he doesn't use the surname Tong anymore because he changed his surname to his mother's surname for complicated reasons. He said, I'm going to use your old name. So you're going to have some anonymity in this book anyway. And most important is it's going to be in English. So a bunch of Americans, English language readers, are going to read this book anyway. And, and my uncle raises his hand and he said, well, I have friends in America. <laughs> I said, really? You have a lot of friends in the US? Like, how many friends do you have? And he says, six. <laughs> So this is what I'm up against, right? This is the power of shame. Um, uh, in the end, you know, we kind of leave it and we don't really agree. And it's actually, on one hand, in a Confucian society, it's kind of challenging to kind of take on your uncle. Uh, number two, in your foreign language, it's, your second language is that much harder to do. Um, and I, actually, I've sent him a copy of the book a couple weeks ago, so we'll see how it goes, <laughs> what his, what his feedback, uh, feedback is. One of the big takeaways from his life story is what historians call kind of antecedents of the Chinese story. So he knows he comes from a family of scholars. Um, and for, for whatever reason, right, he decided that education was kind of this ladder to the future. And this comes after 10 years of no school. There were no returns. To, it wasn't really rational for people to go to school because uh, they didn't understand that it, it made sense at the time. Uh, but, but economic historians, you know, they, they often talk about today's China kind of tapping into some antecedents that go back to this earlier era uh, a century ago. Uh, and kind of the bigger, bigger thing I learned or was reminded, like 100 years ago I was a history minor in college, is, you know, the, the dominant way of, of telling history often is this, this rupture way of understanding history. It's big turning points, right? We're, we reporters, that's our trade. We, we write about turning points. Emperors, wars, presidents, elections. Um, and what's often undertold, at least in my trade, is these long continuities, right? Things that go back further on. And certainly my uncle's life, you know, he, he, he often thinks about his own life in those terms, too, that he is from this kind of scholar family, and he kind of connects to that. And there are a lot of different ways these continuities are thought about in Chinese history. Um, uh, finally, I'll tell you just briefly about my cousin. So this is my uncle's son who, and it's cropped that way because the very important vehicle in the background is a Buick. So he works for General Motors as a, as a kind of a certain level of manager in the factory. And uh, he has a lot of the challenges of the modern, you know, kind of this, this, this generation of people in the 30s in China. Uh, you know, he, 
doesn't have enough money to own property, and so you know he he's not married yet. He has these challenges, and and as as you all know, a lot of you know Chinese women will you know for understandable reasons right, will not marry you unless you own property. Uh, uh, for better or worse, Shanghai women have that particular reputation. <laughs> um, uh, and. But I want to tell you about a, another place he took me when I went back to China. I think this is 2014. He took me to a place in Shanghai I'd never been before, kind of northwestern part of the city, where uh, there was this plan back in the 20s to, to have the, the Shanghai city government, not where it is now, not in the buildings where the, where the neocolonialists and the British and the others built, but they wanted to build a Shanghai kind of by the Chinese people for the Chinese people. And the, the, the building there is this very kind of Ming Dynasty looking, um, very decorative building that was going to become the city hall uh, for that Shanghai urban plan in the 1920s. Uh, in the end, um, and it was going to have a, kind of a box shape, there were going to be four different buildings on this block. It's still very open in that part of China, and there was going to be a road leading down it, so it forms the word middle, like Middle Kingdom. And that was the whole plan then, um, which in the end, uh, it didn't come to pass. So that was, in, I think, in the late 20s. You know, the Japanese first attacked Shanghai in 1932. They come again in 1937. Uh, they don't have money. So it's this kind of failed experiment. But the, the, the question, I think the reason he took me there is because I think the people then and him today were asking a question. I think that's been this timeless question uh, for, for China and the Chinese people is, well, how do we become modern and Chinese at the same time? And he's conflicted himself, right? To him, this plan was very important uh, to have uh, Shanghai for the Chinese people. You know, at the same time, he realizes, right, he has this, this sleeker laptop than I have, and it's, an Ameri it's a you know, foreign brand. He has this you know, fancy advanced camera that I'll never understand, and it's from a Japanese brand. So this kind of being conflicted about China's connection to the outside world, which I think is um, you know, a question that certainly my great-grandfather and these scholars more than 100 years ago were asking. And I think with contemporary China uh, and, and this current president, I think they're asking the same conflicted question, is you know, how do we, what's our connection with the outside world and how do we, become, how do we maintain both? So you know, I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, hi, Mr. Tong. I, I'm a, I'm a uh, Harris student. Um, I was very impressed by your family story. I don't know how you felt when you were talking to your uncle like, or himself about like, his suffering during the time he was left behind by his father. But uh, what I take him from your story, I felt um, your family is actually very uh, lucky. Yeah. <laughs> is how I uh, phrase this because as long as I was surprised your grandmother understand English, can write in English, I was formally educated because by that time most of the Chinese women maybe not even litter. Mm -hmm. So I was very surprised by that and I did seem the education like made a great impact from your family because <laughs> so I was wondering like what's your take him from um, maybe your uncle's story, like left behind when he was left behind. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, my takeaway right from my uncle's life, because as you say, my family has a lot, comes from a fair bit of privilege and literacy, and he was left on the other side, right? So you can do, you can make the movie of the one brother who, who leaves and goes to Taiwan and comes to the US in the 60s, and then what happened to him, right? What was happening to him at the same time? What I find remarkable is I've asked him in a lot of different ways, and my father has too, is you know, what level of uh, bitterness, jealousy, envy you know, does he have? And he doesn't have much. Uh, he often would say, you know, there's nothing you can do. This is just how things went. Uh, certainly, my father is, you know, can kind of offer to help them if they ever want to you know, travel somewhere. And, they turn it all down. I mean, he, his story is entirely DIY. He made it himself. He's very proud. He's appropriately proud 
I think, of the life that he, that he has. Uh, and so what's surprising to me is why he's not more bitter. He perhaps arguably should be more bitter than he actually is. Will your book be published in China? Will it be published in China? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, certainly a lot, a lot of books have been translated by Taiwanese publishers. So that's what I'm uh, pursuing. Yeah, is pursuing the audiobook and then pursuing Chinese translation. So hopefully that'll pin out. Will it be for sale outside? Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, it will be. It will. There will be copies outside. Uh, please. Um, your family has this long history of being inside outside. Your family has this long history of kind of inside outside relationship with China, and now uh, China has so many people studying abroad, working abroad, foreigners coming in. And I was wondering whether you had any sense of how this is mediated inside China all of these kind of international relationships with foreign students and so on. And maybe just to focus the question, you also mentioned the power of self-censorship and whether that has anything to do with this kind of international reach of the Chinese people and what they're allowed to do and bring home and so on. Yeah, well, um, I, I think as far as self-censorship, when I kind of interact with kind of mainland students here, I spent, a, I spent a fellowship year at the University of Michigan doing some research on that. And, and like here, there are a lot of Chinese nationals there. And when I started to, to tell them what I was chasing and, and actually the, the, the history, the version of the history that I have, and a lot of the stories to me are far more interesting. And, and I wish they would, they, would, uh, they would kind of tell it more. And they would you know, maybe tell it to me a little bit. But um, I feel like you know that as far as people who can you know be amplifiers of the recent Chinese story, who would be better to do to do that? And uh, so I think that's a that's a a, a challenge. You know, I, I wish more um, uh, you know mainland students. And maybe maybe that is changing as people who have observed uh, students from the mainland uh, uh, understand what's happening. So, uh, but I, I think. Um, there's been a lot of question over where do they go, right? Mainland students, is, is the U.S. government going to make it harder for them to come over here? Do they still want to come because there are so, so many opportunities? Um, I keep coming back to a conversation, but it's been three years now with my old landlord in Shanghai. And she's a wealthy, uh, you know, kind of Shanghai landowner. And she said, in my circle of friends, um, all of us have either our money or our children in North America. So, so at least to some degree, I think uh, in this, um, you know, there's this dominant narrative, you know, framing in the U.S. of you know how how challenged the U.S. is, but certainly the 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 educational capital, and certainly it's not just the U.S. I think it's still, to me anyway, is still what kind of brings brings people here. And then you know, as as far as the world kind of understanding the Chinese story, the if we have less of that, then we have less of the story. I think. Yes, please. Um, how has, the, uh, um, how has the, uh, the path of discovery, your family history, and experiences of talking to people who, are, who have their first-hand experience along the history of China's economic up and downs uh, during the years, how has it changed your, or if any, changed your perspective on uh, your reporting as mm -hmm. a correspondent? and? Does it give you any sort of like different perspective or even the advantage to sort of try to understand why the narrative inside China and outside of China are so dramatically different? Hmm. Yeah, how is it? You know, it's certainly, as far as reporting on, on China, I think it's, or for me just talking to my colleagues about what I learned in my time there, I think it is, you know, this, this the longer version of the story and how you know this book and others uh, tell the uh, kind of the longer story. I think I, I talk about that more because I think it's more important to kind of understand that this is this right. This is this fast-growing China story, but we have to remember that, right. This is a longer catching-up story, and and how to how do we understand that? How do we kind of tell that beyond just the idea that this is a this is a miracle? So. To me, anyway, I think it's it's more important than ever today 
to, to kind of frame, to help frame what's happening today uh, and tell that version of the story. Individually, I think it's changed me in two ways. Um, when I was a, you know, a foreign American journalist living there, as far as official China, I had a much more, it's a more kind of an adversarial relationship with local governments and, and the central government. Um, and I wasn't, you know, as a business economics reporter, I wasn't always dealing with them. But you know, mostly it was an unproductive relationship. Um, but uh, when I went back as you know, kind of this grandson of China, uh, it was amazing how many um, different kinds of bureaucrats, police officers, um, wanted to help me, try to help me find, uh, understand the story. So I saw a different version of China, you know, as for someone like me trying to do my job, you know, it has, has a rough exterior, uh, but not always. And so I, I, I was much more kind of, kind of optimistic ab about China. And I guess the other big takeaway for me is uh, like a, a lot of people from that kind of early generation, who were uh, scholars or who suffered during these different periods in Chinese history. And, th and, and so often, my, my grandmother kind of wrote about this a lot. You know, is China so weak now? How do we, you know, how do we try to make China stronger? Right? That was how she thought about her education, was these 15, 16, 17-year-old women. Uh, you know, how do we, women become stronger and how do Chinese become stronger? Is what I've been, had the privilege to do is, right, this generation, they didn't get to see the China they helped to build. But I got to see it, and I got to tell a little bit of that story. Thank you. I, I thought that was really fascinating. I'm from Ireland, uh, and as obviously an uh, immigrant or an immigrant here, uh, I'd be interested in what you think the story would be if it were written by a member of your family who stayed in China. So in Ireland, there's really a completely different perspective among people say who came to the United States, many people did come to the United States, who see themselves as a great success uh, and go back to Ireland and still see themselves as yeah. a great success, and Irish people who uh, feel sorry for them in a way because they had to leave their real country and went to a foreign country and maybe they prospered, but they mm -hmm. lost something really fundamental. So when you talked about your uncle not being bitter, the question is why would he be bitter if his perspective is a Chinese perspective rather than an American perspective. Yeah, yeah. What would that's a that's a great question. Like, how would he how would he tell a story? Right? Others and my and his son, my cousin, uh, tell the story of this. You know, I think um, I think they would talk about have the you know the. I think a lot of Chinese nationals are much better than Americans to kind of understand the two sides of the same coin, right? Kind of talk about two ideas that might conflict with each other and how they can, how both can be true. And I think uh, they would talk about having been cursed by just at the wrong time in Chinese history, being connected to being landing on the wrong side of, of history. But then I, I think. You know, they have a much longer view than I have, I think, of how, how things change and how progress happens. I think they would talk about them being in the center of then being on the, on the right side of history that, you know, the early reform period that a lot of us missed. Uh, so my, my uncle talks about the day they, they real estate was privatized and they were living at the university where he worked and he got to right by his his little apartment for almost nothing, right? So, so this property story is at the center of the Chinese economic story. Uh, and so he got to be part of that. Right? He knows where it came from. And my cousin often talks about them getting a, you know, one bottle of milk per week you know, because he was the, uh, the one child in that family and how, where they've gone from then. So I think you know, they're the proud part of the way I think they would tell the story is, right, they, they saw it from the, some of the darkest days, uh, but they saw, they helped write the chapters that took us to today. And then those of us on the outside, we didn't get there until chapter eight. Yeah, although I was more interested in a way in, in identity. So mm. I assume that uh, like people are, they think of themselves as Chinese, they have their national identity, they know who they are, they, it's not an economic question. It's a question of their, their self-identity. 
and they could well see you as the grandson of China, but you know, you, you're sort of lost. You're, yeah, yeah. You're in this foreign country with foreign people that nobody understands what they think. They're stupid. They're insensitive. They say all those things. So, yeah. So they're, sorry, <laughs> they're, they're, they're sorry for you because you have lost an yeah. integral part of yourself, and that's what matters to them, and not yep. economic yeah, success that is uh, described in the American experience. Yeah. Well, I. I think the part they would they would probably say is they don't look at me or my father as being particularly Chinese. Uh, the same people in Taiwan, I think, look at us a little differently as being kind of using a little more of a we concept. On the mainland, it's, it's, it's much different. And so you know, how connected are we to, to the family? Certainly it's, and that's what I found from day one when I got to China, you know, ethnic Chinese, but the outside ethnic Chinese. And that's certainly, uh, uh, kind of a dominant way we experience it from the outside is we're on the outside. Uh, if this has engaged you as much as it engaged me, I hope you'll buy the book. Talk to Scott. You're going to yeah. sit out there and have a chance to chat with people. But in any case, let's thank Scott for coming to Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you.